uh, welcome everyone to a new um, SciTech Asia virtual seminar. It's actually the first uh, SciTech Asia virtual seminar of the current academic year. I'm very thrilled and excited to start with uh, our guest today, uh, Aya Ome, uh, who is going to be talk to us to be talking to us about the history of population policy and population science in uh, in Japan. Let me um, let me introduce you um, a little bit, uh, our guest. But before that, let me also announce that uh, we just launched the new websites, the, our research network, SciTech Asia. So if you like the kinds of events and activities you we organize, you're free to uh, to browse our website at SciTechAsia.org. You'll find um, all previous webinars that we've organized, as well as uh, podcast initiatives on books, on topics at the intersection between science, technology, and society in East Asia and beyond East Asia as well, across the world. Um, so back to our guest today, uh, Aya Ome is a lecturer in Japanese study, in Japanese studies at the University of Manchester. She is uh, specialized in the history of science, technology, and medicine, with a specific focus on the history of reproduction and population in Japan and East Asia, starting from the 19th century up till the 20th uh, century. She is a very well known, I would say, historian of uh, science, technology, and medicine within uh, Asian studies. She's the author of the book Fungal Disease in uh, Britain and the United States, 1850 uh, to 2000, I should say, co author of the book. And her second book, uh, tentatively entitled Science for Governing Japan's Population, which I also think is the title for this talk, will be pub published by Cambridge University Press in the coming years. I don't know if there's already a date, but it's forthcoming. So I'm very thrilled and excited uh, to hear more about the science for governing Japan's population. So Aya, the floor is yours, please. Thank you and welcome to SciTech Asia. Thank you so much, Gonzalo, for such a great uh, introduction. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be here um, because um, I'm a, um, I'm a big fan of this. Um, as soon as uh, you launched this, uh, I found this on podcast and I've been listening it really avidly. Um, and, um, and, and so as this webinar, webinar series, so very honored to be here uh, as well. Um, so without uh, much further ado, I'm gonna start uh, my presentation and I'm going to now use um, uh, web uh, powerpoint uh, which i'm going to share please uh give me a moment um okay hopefully this will work uh we tried to do it um earlier okay so can you only see the um slide which says science for governing japan's population yes it's very clear thank you fantastic okay so i will uh then start um, so yeah, um, before I start, uh, I want to say that um, as uh, Gonzalo uh, has um, uh, suggested, uh, so the title of this talk, uh, Science for uh, Governing Japan's Population, is in fact um, uh, the title of the, the book, uh, the forthcoming book. I'm, for, uh, I'm hoping it's going to be um, published next year. Um, and so this is going to be about about the book. Um, and another uh, uh, kind of disclaimer is that I've already uh, presented a similar um, lecture, uh, a slightly modified version uh, in uh, uh, for the uh, University of Vienna this May. Um, so um, apologies in advance for some overlap. So, um, so essentially the, um, like I said, uh, the, the talk is about this book. And so let me first um, talk about how, um, uh, what, it, what is it about? Um, and also how I came uh, to this, how, how, how I arrived at this um, uh, project, book project. So, 
So Science for Governing Japan's Population is a work of, um, in, a special, in a sense, uh, social history, which examines various um, scientific fields that were established around the notion of uh, Japan's population and um, and also uh, scientific practices that were mobilized for the governing of the population in modern Japan. So before I dive into elaborating on the, uh, the book itself, I'd like to tell you the background to this project, how I came uh, to write write this book, um, because I think this will kind of make it easier uh, for, you, for, you, for you to kind of contextualize uh, what I'm going to say afterwards. So to be really totally frank, um, this book was an uh, unintended outcome. Uh, uh, historians like to talk about unintended consequences, but it certainly was. Uh, and in fact, uh, it was originally going to be um, chapter one of another book I was writing uh, uh, on Japan's family planning initiatives and their links to global health. So, as some of you uh, already know, um, in the original project, which is still going, um, I was studying uh, Japan's effort uh, in healthcare diplomacy uh, through international cooperation in family planning um, as a tool to uh, reconstruct Japan's international reputation in the post-colonial and Cold War context in the 1960s and 70s. Now I was asking for that for that um, project. I was asking so what it meant for Japan after uh, the war, Second World War, um, that was struggling to reestablish itself in the reconfigured regional geopolitics under the Cold War. So what it what it meant for Japan in that situation to endorse Made in Japan, what they say Made in Japan family planning abroad and especially in Asia. Now, when I was looking at sources, I quickly noticed from early on uh, in my research that the term population uh, or in jinko in Japanese uh, was mentioned uh, kind of as an inseparable um, entity to family planning uh, in the languages sorry, in the languages overseas development aids and international cooperation. Um, as you see on the screen, if you see, uh, if you can understand Japanese um, or, or even Chinese, um, you, you, can, you can see how the terms um, uh, kazoku keikaku, which is family planning and jinko are kind of presented always as a set. So when I began to wrap up this project um, and started to write a monograph, I began to think uh, it would be really necessary to show a history behind this specific type, you know, way of presenting um, kind of population and family planning as part and parcel in the expression that refer to the field of promoting uh, family planning in Japan's overseas development aids. But then uh, I quickly realized you have to do quite a lot of work and unpacking uh, for this part of the work. And this turned into a book itself. <laughs> so here we go. So as I dug deeper into the history, um, I was able to make a number of observations. So one of these observations was um, the term population, uh, as we are familiar today, was a, is a neologism. So a new term that only emerged and consolidated through the Meiji period, um, 1868 and 1912, uh, for those of you, you, know, you who are less familiar with Japanese history. And so this was the case um, with so many, you know, and, and this, this term population, you know, it was, you know, like um, it was a, um, a new term that was, you know, so many, uh, one of so many uh, that almost erupted uh, during this period, including the term science, right, kagaku. Now, as with other neologisms, the, this new term population, oh, sorry, excuse me, um, brought with it a novel way of seizing um, the people and uh, social phenomena with numbers. So for instance, 
uh, if you could look at uh, this poster, a um, few people in Japan today uh, look at it and would even think tw twice this way of representing Japanese population is scandalous. Um, so just to explain uh, the poster. So this is a poster called Japan Seen, th sorry, Japan Seen from the Perspective of a Population of 100 People. And it's created and updated annually uh, by the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, uh, which is the ministry uh, in charge of population health statistics um, since almost uh, the foundation of its precursor Ministry of Health and Welfare. Uh, that was established in 1938. Here you see um, the people are represented in decimal numbers, right? 12.7 persons are 15 years old, old and over, uh, old, old and over, and um, oh, sorry, 12.7 uh, persons are 15 years old and under, and 12, uh, 26.7 uh, are 65 years old and over, and so on and so forth. Now, today, we know this is just a statistical representation, and this doesn't mean we literally, you know, cut people's bodies into pieces or, uh, you know, by presenting the Japanese population in this way. But, um, so, like I said, um, historically speaking, it wasn't uh, so... Uh, this, this way of representing numbers or the, the population of people was literally foreign um, to, pe to Japanese people in the 1860s. Uh, I'll just explain, uh, sorry, I'll just uh, introduce this um, wording of uh, a guy called Sugi Koji. Uh, he was uh, known as, or he is today known as, um, the kind of father of population statistics. Um, he was one of the uh, early Meiji uh, technocrats. Um, now, Sugi told in his biography, which was actually transcribed later by his disciple, uh, that saying this, right? He, he had a look at, he had access to this Dutch um, newspaper or, or, or materials and then found that um, people, are uh, um, represented in decimal numbers. And he thought that was very strange. So this episode clearly indicates um, that this specific way of numerically representing people was new in Japan in the 1860s, right? Even among the educated people like Sugi himself. And what was more, uh, in the 1860s, certain ways of interpreting the population and ways of using uh, population data that we saw take for, take, take for granted today were not there either. So today we assume, uh, for instance, that a human population is a dynamic force um, that mirrors the state of a collective of people with multiple social attributes. And, you know, and, and they, they comprise a, a socio-political unit. We also think it's natural that we can analyze um, population trends to uh, project future, uh, estimate uh, what, what we, you know, what we would be uh, in the future. So, for instance, as this uh, example shows. So this is a front cover. Of, um, journal, uh, of the book uh, that was written by a journalist called Kawaii Masahi, uh, Masashi. Uh, it was a bestseller uh, book in 2018, and it's, it's called The Future uh, Chronology. Uh, that, was pub uh, that was published in that year. And it shows a list of future years and what would happen uh, during the years. Uh, for instance, 2020, uh, half the women are over 50 years old. Well, it's no longer um, uh, uh, future, but yes, it happened. Uh, 2024, one third of the, pop the total population is 60 years old, old and over and so on. Now to come up with this future chronology, uh, Kawaii used the population projection, which was published by the government's Population Research Institute, National Institute for Population and Social Security Research, uh, Japan. 
So this example um, indicates how we think it's self-evident that we can um, predict future based on the demographic trends today. And finally, based on this understanding of population, the Japanese government tries to modify people's behaviors uh, via policies for the sake of improving the situations in the future. But as I just said earlier, before the 1860s under the Tokugawa Bakufu, our assumptions today about this inherent link between numerical data, population trends, and social phenomena, and the roles assigned to um, rulers and public intellectuals to come up with solutions to the population problems uh, by means of policy for the future, they were, they were simply not there. So I must though say uh, that this didn't necessarily mean uh, that Tokugawa rulers were oblivious to population facts. Uh, in fact, many uh, domain rulers in the Tokugawa period did collect population data for the purpose of, uh, uh, for the purpose of religious control, covey, or taxation. Uh, as you can see on the screen, this is an example of, um, uh, of uh, kind of population register um, there that lists people's name and their um, social status um, or uh, status within the family, um, to be uh, strictly speaking. Um, but anyway, my point here is that these measures we know we're familiar today uh, about you know, surrounding the notion of population were not um, at the uh, were not there, and and at the time uh, these Tokugawa measures um, were uh, were not based on the sociological understanding of population data we're familiar today. So in in, in this way, what Mary Povey uh, once called the culture of fact or numerical facts was not simply there in Japan before the 1860s. So the assumptions of brown population we uphold today have been gradually formed uh, over the modern period. Uh, and I argue that the formation of these assumptions uh, was intimately tied to the transformation of Japan into a modern sovereignty, uh, both as a modern nation state and empire. So then the question I pursued in this book was um, how, sorry, were the assumptions about population, facts and roles of the government normalized alongside the changing contours of Japan as a modern sovereignty? And to tackle this question, I focused on the role that population science played in the Japanese state's attempts to govern its population for the sake of its sovereignty. And here is the list of the fields and practices associated with population science I examined for the book. Now, and I, for this, uh, for the book, I follow the footstep of Susan Greenhow who used the term population science to describe various medical scientific fields that engaged with the so-called one, you know, uh, for, in her case, the uh, um, one-child policy of People's Republic of China. Uh, I used the term population science and avoided using demography, which, as you know, is in fact the established nomenclature, right, Na name uh, for the field today. Uh, I can't, for, because of the time, I can't elaborate on this point now, uh, but um, perhaps we can come back to this uh, point uh, in the Q&A. But you might wonder, why focus on population science? Um, how would looking at population science help us to un answer the question I had uh, for the book, which was how were the assumptions about population facts and roles of the government normalized alongside the changing contours of Japan as modern sovereignty? So the first obvious answer in response to this question is because uh, population science was very much um, attributable uh, to the creation and, and consolidation of our assumptions about population facts and roles of the government in population management. But there are other good reasons for this focus, uh, and for that I can present two. 
The first is, as Michel Foucault pointed out already in the 1970s, um, demography as both a subject of inquiry and a uh, um, scientific field acted as a, uh, an instrument of go modern governance by providing rhetorical um, devices with which to capture individuals or groups as legally and socially contained groups, right, uh, that were amenable to political interventions. So obviously drawing on this governmentality study um, uh, inspired by Foucault uh, from roughly, you know, for over the last um, a few decades, works have mushroomed um, that show the kind of thorough entanglement um, between, uh, you know, with, uh, uh, in between demography and the running of the nation state as modern sovereign power, which manifested in different national contexts. So here I'm thinking of Karl Ittman or Libby Schwaber, Susan Greenhouse and Tom Lam and etc. But we simply do not know how this uh, Michel Foucault's notion of demography acted as an instrument of modern governance in the Japanese context, especially at the time when Japan was turning into a modern sovereignty. Um, though we know a fair bit about the concept, which is, you know, coterminous to population, for instance, race, um, you know, uh, or, or, um, or um, yeah, or jinshu or minzoku in Japanese. Um, you know, this has been, we know fair bit how that, that has been mobilized along with empire and nation building. But population like race was very much a concept which was born out of uh, Japan's empire nation building exercise. And so the focus on population science clarifies the role of modern science in the making of modern sovereign power in Japan. So the second reason why the focus on population science is beneficial um, for the question uh, uh, you know, I'm asking, but also for the uh, kind of uh, wider study of uh, you know, history of science, technology, medicine in East Asia, is that it highlights the role of technical bureaucrats. Oh, um, oops, sorry. Um, so, highlights the role of uh, technical bureaucrats in establishing and maintaining Japan as a modern nation state and empire while normalizing the scientific knowledge and societies. Here I must say that the, uh, the research looking at the significant role of elite um, technical bureaucrats in uh, advancing not only modern science, technology and medicine, but also making it useful for uh, Japan's nation and empire building effort is nothing new. And I'm here thinking of the works of, for instance, James Bartholomew in the Japanese context, um, Hiromi Mizuno and late Aaron Moore and so on. But so far, the focus in this type of research has been primarily on technology or what uh, we might call today uh, call hard science. Now, in contrast, uh, population science was uh, and still is known for its diversity and, uh, and which involved not only a diverse range of scientific fields such as the, you know, it involved, um, but also uh, social sciences, right? uh, not only like um, um, uh, kind of, I would say kind of hard, hard science, um, but also uh, social sciences, um, but uh, such as sociology, anthropology, you know, social policy, and more recently gender studies. So, so you see my point already by looking at the technical bureaucrats I covered in the book alone. So the technical bureaucrats I covered included really like a vast uh, uh, kind of range of individuals. Uh, for instance, musician Ash Tisaburo, who was a mid-ranking statistician in colonial Taiwan with initial training in materiology. And also Tachi Minoru, uh, who was uh, an economic, uh, trained in economics. Uh, and also uh, Shinozaki Nobuo, who was an anthropologist or trained anthropologist, uh, also did a lot of studies on race, um, uh, 
different races uh, and eugenics. Um, and uh, oops, sorry. Uh, Nagai Toru, who was a, uh, a, a, social, a social policy specialist. Uh, and not le last not least, uh, Koya Yoshio, who was a biostatistician, uh, but also uh, credited for um, having established a field called public health demography. I'm going to come back to um, him later. But um, you can see from this list that technical bureaucrats uh, working on population issues could be found anywhere in the government bureaucracy, and they were. And importantly, uh, they were not only administering, uh, ad so administering population data for the government, but played a critical role in the kind of statecraft as policy advisors and policy makers and they were also central in the making of uh, population knowledge and also scientific communities uh, around the modern notion of population. So because of their uh, involvement, both in the knowledge making and policy making uh, around the issues of population, technical bureaucrats were a great lens uh, through which to see how our assumptions uh, about population facts were normalized along with the changing contours of, of, of Japan as a modern and scientized sovereignty. So this in turn means I wanted to show um, the story of a science statecraft interplay around the notion of population that supported the modern projects of nation and empire building. So, through studying these uh, technical bureaucrats, I present mainly two arguments. So the first is that um, the um, creation of the human and social science uh, of, of you know, pertaining to population and the state sovereignty based on population management had a symbiotic relationship. And each was driven by surrounding ideologies, institutional Agents, uh, sorry, agendas, uh, socio-political and material conditions and personal motivations. And the second point uh, is that uh, transnational elements were important in shaping science making and nation building, um, although the interplay on the surface asserts the nation centered discourse. And I and finally from uh, these arguments, I give my view uh, that because the notion of population uh, as an aggregate played a pivotal role in the symbiotic relations uh, between policy making and science making, the population policies that came out of the, this interplay, uh, science statecraft interplay, were in some cases somewhat detached from the realities uh, people faced in their lives. Okay, um, so in relation to the question of why study kind of Japanese population science, um, I want to say that the Japanese story is particularly illuminating uh, because of the kind of unique political um, constellation uh, in which the consensus about population and its role for sovereignty emerged. Uh, so in Japan, uh, the consensus was made in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the political context in which the profile of the Japanese uh, modern sovereignty was itself uh, kind of in flux. So one crucial point to note for the study of population science in Japan is that the science state interplay emerged and, oh, oh I did actually, sorry, I did, uh, press the button earlier and, and was elaborated on, on during the specific moment of world history when Japan had just emerged, um, oh sorry, emerged and entered uh, international politics. And so its status and future, um, at the time I'm talking about kind of, um, kind of late, uh, uh, kind of mid to late uh, 19th century was not really um, certain. Uh, so, for instance, when the official ad, uh, administration began to collect vital statistic, 
statistics in the 1870s, Japan was a novice in world politics, uh, which was dominated by Western colonial powers, right? Um, so in contrast to Western, uh, sorry, U European countries such as England and, and France, where population science developed on top of the state system that already existed, the science of population in Japan developed along with Japan as a political unit. So Japan's state making and state running process relied on the science of population and vice versa. And so the Japanese case uh, shows how the science was an integral part uh, of the process of nation, um, uh, nation building and also empire building in this case, uh, in the case of Japan. Um, population science was a constitutive force uh, that made Japan's unique position uh, in the increasingly globalized world as the non, only non-white and non-Christian modern nation and empire. And after the uh, Second World War, uh, first an occupied and independent nation. And during the Cold War era, a reconstructed uh, nation, uh, sorry, democratic well, officially democratized state, uh, which contributed to the construction of the buffer zone uh, in East Asia. And population science established its position by normalizing the use of numerical uh, demographic facts that were used to govern its subjects. And in turn, uh, so in this uh, project, uh, this book project, um, that illustrates this fluid boundaries between science politics and state administration uh, also reminds us how susceptible the science was from the forces that aim to stabilize socio-political orders. Right? So here, of course, I had just the most classical work in mind. So based on the arguments, I studied these uh, topics. Um, sorry, so along with the, so, so this is the um, kind of how uh, I construct, how, how I organize the book. Um, so the, uh, as you can see, the um, one column or, or sorry, row uh, represents uh, a chapter. So, uh, so here, so for instance, chapter one, I looked at uh, population statistics, uh, roughly 1860s and 1890s, and here's the key kind of events and topics I, I dealt with in that in that chapter and so it goes on one two three four five six so you have I have six um, subjects and also six chapters uh, which are organized as you can see on the screen uh, roughly chronologically um, well I have to say that um, these um, as, as a form of disclaimer I suppose um, that you know I can't really capture the, the diversity, the, the breadth of um, the fields, right? The, the, the diversity of you know, wide ranging uh, fields that are involved in, you know, were and are uh, included uh, under, the, under the name of population science. Um, but I've chosen these um, uh, subjects or, or, or practices or fields um, in, uh, in part because, or mostly because, uh, these pr practices that happened uh, or, or the actors um, uh, were closely related to um, the kind of governing of Japan's population, so sovereignty, Japan as a sovereignty. So for the remainder of the time, I'll give you, um, I think you might want to kind of uh, have, a, have a taste of um, uh, you know what the book is like. Uh, so I'm going to give a uh, a story from the last chapter, chapter six, um, about public health, a field called public health demography, which was the field uh, technical bureaucrat Yoshio Koya uh, established in the late 1940s, based on his uh, kind of birth control campaign and abortion and, and family planning studies. So I hope you get a flavor of the kind of stories I'm telling in the manuscript. So to start with, who is Koya Yoshio or Yoshio Koya? Um, so Koya is the family name, uh, just to clarify. 
So who is Koya who developed the field of public health demography? So Koya is a, in a way, a, a must individual for scholars who study the history of race science and eugenic uh, in modern Japan. Um, Koya's name appears uh, already in Oguma Age's work on the, uh, on the Japanese race from the 1980s. So Koya was one of the most really influential uh, medical researchers in race science and also promoters of eugenics um, as, a, as a kind of uh, scientific field, but also uh, as a kind of advocacy in a way, as a form of advocacy. So he was really dedicated to these, uh, these things at the prime of his career, uh, which kind of spanned between the 1930s and 1960s. So he was the uh, vice president uh, of uh, Japan Association for Racial Hygiene, uh, which was a powerful circle of intellectuals which aimed to promote eugenics um, uh, during, the, uh, during the 1930s and onwards. And Koya also was a propo uh, so proponent of the so-called pure blood, oh, sorry, I, I didn't have that entry, um, pure blood camp of the eugenics. So, um, um, so, uh, in, so which asserted that um, Japan or the Japanese uh, race is, uh, is a pure blood um, uh, kind of, yeah, racial group which descended from the imperial family. Um, a long time ago, not as a result of kind of hybrid, like or mixture with other races. Uh, we can maybe come back to this point if you have some questions later. Now, Koya originally had career in the academia as a professor of, or assist, uh, I would say assistant professor of medicine in Kanazawa University. This is a provincial um, city in the north of Japan. But from 1939, he became hired as a technocrat or gikan in Japanese uh, by the Ministry of Health and Welfare. Um, so the, the ministry was uh, established in 1938, so he was immediately hired uh, after that. Right? And he was uh, at the center of the Ministry of Health, Welfare, Welfare's race studies, um, and at the same time involved in uh, drafting, sorry, yeah, drafting important policy documents on wartime population policies. So that's that's Koya. You can see how important he was, um, you know, in within the government, but also in the in the in, in the field uh, of race science. Now, Koya was um, so after the war. Um, Koya was one of those many elites whose career were um, not compromised by Japan's surrender uh, in 1945, and in fact, after the war. Koya became even bigger. <laughs> so he became appointed by the um, uh, general headquarters. So it's the, um, the occupation's uh, administrative wing uh, to head the Institute of Pop uh, Public Health. And he remained in the position until he moved to Nihon University in the 1960s. And from the late 1940s, um, he used his this influential status, uh, status to persuade the government to implement eugenic uh, birth control programs as population policies. Now, at the same time, after the war, Koya established himself as a central figure in the popular uh, birth control movement. So that's that's him, uh, that's Koya. So just to give you some background information, um, so officials and public intellectuals immediately after Japan's surrender in 1945 began to argue that, that Japan was confronted with two kinds of population problems. Um, the first being the crisis, uh, 
sorry, yeah, two, two kinds of population problems, or so Japanese jinko mondai. And the first was the crisis in the quality of the Japanese race. Um, and then the second was overpopulation, that Japan is now um, kind of crowded uh, with, uh, with a population with the sudden influx of repatriated soldiers and civilians from the war front. Right. Uh, and of course, Japan lost colonies at the time. So many of them, in fact, um, so called repatriated uh, or we came back home, right, to, to, to these uh, so called small archipelago. So, so to solve these population issues, the government first uh, revived the work wartime national eugenic law and issued the uh, Eugenic Protection Law in 1948, which aimed to protect the quality of Japanese population by controlling uh, the reproductive bodies of the people, apparently with inferior um, biological traits uh, through abortion, contraception, and sterilization. But the law, and, and I have to say Koya was heavily, heavily involved in the creation of, um, or the drafting of this, um, this, this kind of, uh, these um, policy. Now, but this law, um, you, I'm talking about eugenic protection law, um, and especially uh, when it was amended in 1949, uh, it kind of de facto legalized abortion. And this uh, de facto legalization of abortion led to the surge in the number of abortion cases. Uh, and so the government had to do something, uh, at least, um, you know, people like Koya were saying, well, we should do something about it. So in response, in 1951, the cabinet approved the proposal, which was made by the government's advisory council on population problems to popularize birth control across the country. And based on this, uh, in 1952, uh, the um, government amended the eugenic uh, protection law to build the public health infrastructure that facilitated the spread of birth control practices among uh, the people. So, um, now, Koya was at the center of this policy making process. Um, so he was the head of the, uh, as a head of the uh, Institute of Public Health, he was really well connected uh, with the influential health officials, both within the government and in the uh, uh, GHQ general headquarters, uh, not least uh, uh, Crawford F. Sams, uh, you can see him on the screen here. Uh, who was uh, the who was heading the um, uh, the public health and welfare section of the GHQ, and also uh, Koya was a member of the advisory council on population problems, which was advising the government, uh, sorry, the cabinet uh, on the population matters. Right. So, and so he, he really was um, behind. Um, and, and in fact, evidence shows that um, it was Koya who uh, swayed the opinion of Hashimoto Ryogo, the Minister, Minister of Health and Welfare at the time. And uh, as a result, um, you know, the, the, the 1951 uh, birth control policy was implemented. So as you can see, it's quite at, at the center, really at the center. Now, the, however, um, within the government, oh, sorry, sorry. However, within the government, um, there were concerns um, or government officials, uh, there were concerns that um, this might in fact, you know, birth control might uh, promote uh, what, what they called natural, uh, sorry, uh, um, reverse selection, uh, which was the, uh, which is kind of the opposite of natural selection. So if you, uh, uh, in the in the uh, pre-war period, eugenicists argue that if you um, uh, birth control would promote um, the kind of the um, the reduction of uh, people with superior traits uh, and the expansion of people with um, uh, inferior traits, uh, it's because. Um, um, 
birth control was, uh, when it was introduced in, the, in Japan in the 1920s, it was mostly practiced by people, uh, by kind of urban uh, intellectual class, uh, which, you know, people thought, uh, you know, pe scholars thought um, had, you know, uh, generally speaking, uh, as a collective had superior uh, biological traits. So Koya knew, you know, as a eugenicist, obviously he acknowledged that. Um, so to counter this kind of voice of concern, Koya then proposed a guided birth control program. Um, so in the guided birth control program, uh, government officials and population experts and health practitioners would work hand in hand to promote um, contraception through what Koya called guidance or sometimes called enlightenment activity. So the biggest feature of this guided program was that it really aimed narrowly at specific target groups um, with growing, you know, the groups with growing population. Um, and, and for that, uh, Koya identified rural populations, workers and benefit recipients uh, in cities as, as, yeah, as target groups and explicitly excluded the educated middle class in cities. Now, Koya suggested through this guided birth control program, um, uh, the government could have the cake and eat it, right? have the cake and eat it. Right? So, um, so in other words, they could prevent the huge population growth and at the same time, uh, protect the racial integrity or quality of the Japanese population. Right. Oh, sorry. This. So, okay. So, and what's remarkable is that Koya used his political power not only to influence policy making, uh, but at the same time to build his academic empire. Uh, around the policy relevant population research, uh, specifically on abortion and birth control. So while advising the government on public uh, uh, health and population matters, uh, as the director of the Institute of Public Health, Koya also uh, used influence to set up a new academic department. Okay, so research, yeah. And, and that was called the Department of Public Health Demography. Here, here we go, we have public health demography, uh, which was established or launched, officially launched in 1949. And you can see, if you look at the official document and that defined the area of expertise of this department, uh, here are three, uh, as you can see on the screen, basically um, from the inset, the department organized um, research around Koya's interest. Um, and, and also, you know, research that was directly useful for the government's population policy. So here's a list of um, some representative um, studies that happened within the department uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, so in Koya's mind, the aim of these studies was to show really two things. The first was uh, the growing number of induced abortion rates, rates, and then the second was that the guided birth control program as a countermeasure for the population uh, growth uh, and what the Ministry of uh, Hashimoto, uh, Health Hashimoto uh, in the mid 1940s called Japan's racial crisis, right? So specifically, these studies were intended to show the effectiveness of the program, the family planning program, uh, in reducing both uh, birth rates and abortion rates among the target groups. So, um, so these studies um, really uh, uh, at the, at the, at the uh, department are particularly illuminating for considering the science statecraft nexus around the concept of population uh, the, and the book's um, uh, arguments I mentioned earlier. Because first, firstly, uh, these policy relevant um, 
department uh, studies that singled out uh, lower and working class people for population control made the reproductive bodies of the people in those social groups legible for the state, right? Uh, that, to use um, Scott's words. So through these studies, it became clear in front of the state which reproductive bodies should be subject to state intervention. And secondly, um, they really show these studies how the science state uh, craft, uh, statecraft interplay was not always smooth. And in fact, um, precarity uh, was ingrained in the science uh, producing data and the knowledge that substantiated population policies. So, um, you know, I, I always say science and statecraft, you know, they had symbiotic relations, but it was sometimes um, stood on the kind of really kind of dodgy, <laughs> precarious um, ground, at least uh, practically and also on an epistemological basis. And finally, although the studies at the um, Department of Public Health Demography were primarily there to support domestic um, policies, they were also ingrained in the transnational movement uh, that emerged in the middle of the 20th century that aimed to curb the world population growth via fertility regulation in developing countries. So to illustrate these points, uh, I want to quickly introduce uh, this, uh, well, actually one study, uh, two, two projects, um, one is the Katsushika Ward study, and the other I'm going to quickly uh, introduce is uh, the Kajia Village uh, foam tablet study. And okay, so the Katsushika Ward study started in April 1953 and targeting the uh, residents of Katsushika Ward. Oops, sorry, and they were the recipients of public health, uh, public sorry, public relief under the livelihood protection law. So the poor people, basically. For the Katsushika Ward study, researchers, oops, sorry, um, initially initially recruited four hundred eighteen women, but in the end could only analyze two hundred seventy seven. And Koya headed the project, and these are the people who uh, from the from the department who did the field work, and the, the study was uh, for three years. So, what's fascinating about this study is how much researchers' assumption about the, about the people of lower socioeconomic class uh, were ingrained in the study. So. Initially, the researchers really assumed that their subject would be generally resistant to birth control um, because there was a, a proverb that said, in Japan, poor people have more children, um, right? Uh, sorry, so here's, uh, here's uh, one of the quotes uh, which, um, uh, from one of the uh, researchers there. So you can see that uh, this phrase um, of uh, late, this called bimbo kodak some poor people have more children, in fact, which linked poverty, ignorance, and fecundity. Uh, it was a really common trope uh, that described the lower socioeconomic group uh, for, for population studies of the time. And it certainly informed the medical researchers' views uh, of their research subject. Um, okay. And in the end, um, Koya declared uh, the Katsushika Ward study was a success. Um, so the, um, and used the study to really persuade um, the government to support a family planning program, uh, which was targeting, uh, targeting the poor. So as it, uh, so in 1955, um, that, so the, uh, the, the government uh, established a budget to enforce a birth control program among the extremely poor, um, to, I'm just quoting from the, uh, the evidence, and so, and, and so, and so on. Um, so basically, uh, the success, uh, success in, the, in, the, in the science or the, the, the data directly informed and mobilized policy, policy measures. 
So the Katsushika Award study shows two specific ways in which the science as a pursuit of natural orders and the statecraft seeking social political orders were co-produced. So, so this here is again kind of Jasanov's words. So firstly, it depicts how the knowledge about the naturalized concept of population was constructed through the policy relevant scientific research and was co-produced with vectors that consolidated existing social orders. Oh, so this is, this is the first point. And secondly, it describes how um, population science was co-produced with the consolidation of state power in order to intervene in people's lives via policy making. But this co-productive effort in science and state um, statecraft was not always smooth. And in fact, if we look at the uh, Katsushika Ward study, it was really rife with problems from the beginning. Um, the field work, so to start with, um, so we're talking about the field work in Katsushika, the staff found, um, found it really difficult, difficult to really keep track of research participants because of the high turnover uh, rate. Um, and also, um, so the, the, and the second point was that this normally for the guided birth control or family planning uh, uh, pro program, routine guidance uh, had to be implemented or, you know, it's, it's a kind of pillar part of the, um, the program. But in the Katsushika uh, work, it just routine guidance didn't work. Um, for a number of reasons, uh, for for instance, one of one of one of them was that um, you know uh, women didn't like to talk about their intimate you know um, details uh, at, at their home. That gets you know there were like you know uh, their family members around and you know that that kind of constraint. Um, yeah, so so the home home visit wasn't really um, possible. Uh, another, yeah, um, and, and, ho and home visit was another kind of um, important uh, kind of part of the program. Uh, okay. And oh, another really important part was that because of the uh, kind of um, structural and infra uh, infrastructural and also institutional um, kind of constraint, they failed to offer a wide range of contraceptive options, which uh, in other um, kind of studies um, or guided program, Koya thought uh, was the um, uh, one of the kind of important uh, factors that made uh, other studies successful, uh, but they were not able to um, offer that to, in the Katsushika Ward uh, study. Um, so, so in, in the nutshell, the Katsushika Ward study was nothing at all like other model birth control studies uh, Koya uh, had been uh, practicing so far, although you know, others also had some problems. Um, or, or the, you know, uh, yeah. Um, so after these so many problems, the department uh, staff uh, research team had to really flexibly adapt to local conditions. And one of the solutions they came up with was to change the framework of the Katsushika Ward study. And they now argued that they were focusing on analyzing the increased use of um, what they called simple contraceptive methods. Um, so for instance, like condoms or foam tablets or other simple methods, right? Um, so, and it re it's really interesting. So this turn um, to uh, simple, you know, the study of simple contraceptive methods and the decision towards it um, to focus on this uh, in the Katsushika study was one of many threads that wove this domestically oriented activities of the institutional, insti sorry, uh, Institute of Public Health um, this department into the transnational population control movement. 
because the movement was actually built on the slightly uh, condescending sending assumption that contraceptives used by people in underdeveloped countries should be simple enough for those recipients with low education level could handle. So it's kind of the rhetorically, you know, the Japanese are actually um, kind of appropriated that kind of argument. And one of the very important individuals that connected this um, connecting uh, Koya's uh, uh, kind of domestic studies with the environment, uh, sorry, with the transnational movement was this guy called Clarence Gamble. Uh, he was an American guy, an active participant. Oh, sorry. Uh, and he was an active participant in the kind of global transnational uh, movement to uh, promote family planning in developing countries. Um, and he was the one who pursued simple contraceptive methods among uh, women in the developed nations as a strategy for global population control. So Gamble was one of those who believed in the simple contraceptive methods for, uh, for global population control and so was investing quite a lot of money and time for developing and finding these methods uh, and uh, or kind of trialing these methods uh, in a local setup. And through, so at some point in the late, eight, uh, late 1940s, uh, through uh, the guy called, uh, he, the very noted demographer, Frank W. Nordstein, who was uh, in Japan just temporarily um, serving for the uh, uh, occupation government, uh, through Nordstein, um, Gamble got to know Koya, got to know about Koya. And so in the late 1940s, Gamble approached Koya and basically asked uh, whether Koya would be happy to do uh, kind of um, the, the uh, research, uh, birth control research on, on, on simple contraceptive methods uh, within Japan. And for that, um, uh, Gambo uh, actually gave some money uh, to Koya to do the research. So Gambo was behind Koya's birth control research uh, in the 1950s. And um, one of Koya's projects Gambo supported on simple contraceptive methods was called the Kajia study. And that tested the efficacy of the spermicidal foam tablet called uh, Sampoon. Uh, and with Sampoon was really recently uh, developed by the Japanese pharmaceutical company called uh, Eizai. Now, in fact, Koya launched this study uh, in response to Gamble's suggestion. Um, and really interestingly, the reason Gamble was interested in Sampoon was because he was convinced that a uh, this uh, this simple contraceptive method, uh, so sorry, Sampoon was uh, the simple contraceptive method of the future. And especially in India, uh, which was at the time the target of global population control and where Gamble was actually actively promoting other brands of foam tablets. And importantly, because Gamble was so vested in the foam tablet, um, he had quite a heavy handed approach uh, to the Kajia village study. So in a way, through Gamble's involvement, uh, Koya's research became an integral part uh, of, oh, sorry, of um, the transnational network which buttressed the efforts to discipline reproductive bodies in underdeveloped countries for a great goal, cause of global population control. So with the case of Koya and public health democracy, demography, I wanted to show how population science was at the heart of Japan's efforts to cope with the surrender and reconstruct the nation through the disciplining of reproductive bodies. At the same time, I wanted to call for attention to the fact that transnational elements uh, clearly participated in the interplay between science making and governing of Japan's population. 
So the story of science for governing uh, Japan's population after Japan's surrender in ninety, uh, so uh, in the in the uh, in the war, Second World War, was very much a national story, but at the same time more complex than a mere national endeavor. Um, so it was firmly embedded in and mobilized by the the diverse networks and practices that entangle the national with the local and transnational. And this is what I wanted to show in chapter six, in the final chapter of the book. And this concludes my uh, presentation today. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. Uh... I owe um, a really very, very nice, uh, very rich, incredibly rich presentation, I have to say. Um, before I open the floor for questions, and if you would like to ask a question, please uh, either raise your hand uh, and then I will just hand the floor to you and you just uh, identify yourself and you ask a question directly to the speaker or else you are very, very much welcome to just write uh, a question uh, via the chat box uh, function. Okay, so while you gather your thoughts, I have a, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the privilege of being the chair of this talk, and I'm gonna ask uh, a couple of, of questions. And I would say that my first one is sort of a, a, a more long historical, uh, long durée kind of question. And, you know, I got the impression in the presentation you you um, you just gave to us, that you um, you highlight uh, a clear cut uh, you know um, shift uh, in the way that population statistics were used by um, policy uh, policy agents and also elites connected to uh, to the government. Um, you um, you mentioned at some point that. You know, there was a period before population statistics and a period after population statistics. Um, and of course, I mean, you uh, drew on this uh, literature coming out of the work of Foucault and, 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 and so on and so forth on governmentality and the role of population, population science. Coming from a sort of China studies background, one of the debates that you know, uh, has emerged strongly in relationship to Foucault, especially within the historical, the historical research rather than the more contemporary late 20th century, early 21st century research, is that, um, you know, researchers are divided as to what extent there is such a rupture uh, in the sense that in the historical records in China, you can find you know, um, various kinds of household records maintained at different levels of the government. And that were used for multiple purposes, you know, um, taxation, cons conscription, um, and even in some cases, you know, functionalities that we associate with Foucaultian governmentality, governing the conduct of everyday life, actually shaping the conduct of everyday life. Um, so I wonder, so that's my first question. I wonder if you find similar debate in Japan, whether the, you know, whether the, the borderline is not so clear cut, there are some, you know, fuzzy, uh, fuzzy, um, some kind of fuzzy transition there going on there, or, or whether, you know, um, by contrast, whether Japan perhaps is a case of clear cut a clear cut uh, transformation. So I'd like to hear you a bit more on that. I don't know if you want to respond to that first or whether you want to take my uh, my second question. Maybe before I forget what I want to say, okay. I'll just okay. say it now. Just go for it. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, thanks for the thanks for the the question. This is a really kind of very almost like a core of. Um, also, uh, the the debate I'm also engaging, um, and of course, um, 
in J Japanese literature as well, um, you know, uh, uh, many of the uh, scholars argue um, that, um, you know, Sawayama Mikako is one of them, um, you know, Susan Burns is another, um, that, you know, said that, yes, you know, the ways in which rulers, um, in, you know, try to discipline reproductive bodies and also um, to use population registers, um, uh, you, you know, you can certainly see it wasn't a rupture, you know, it wasn't just here's the modern nation and, and, um, and, you know, we do this in the kind of new way. And of course, on the rhetorical, you know, on the, on the rhetorical level, yes, that was the case, right. Um, but uh, I think what I wanted to show it, especially in the earlier chapters, um, and in the first chapter, is how, you know, it was quite, um, full of, like I said, uh, you know, the government, of course, the government, when you say the government, the uh, Meiji government, um, they didn't know what they were doing in a way. Um, and then when you say scientists, they were also, you know, kind of trying to kind of cope with the situation at the time. And so, for instance, I can see that, you know, the one, one place where, you know, um, you see a kind of really murky area where transformation didn't really happen in a clear-cut manner was um, how they try to, um, the, 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 the kind of tension um, uh, uh, those population statisticians or, you know, the, the, the new group um, had with the government about census, you know, so, so the the government thought that well we've got these population registers and you know isn't that isn't that enough that we just you know modify just reform these and um uh, you know and and so that's what they were doing actually <laughs> you know at the at, in the earlier period whereas of course the and, and of course uh, scientists uh, oh like sugi um thought you know he was enamored by the new way of doing you know kind of collecting census and he wanted to try that out um, he said that no we have to we have to pursue modern way of um, you know uh, collecting population facts and and uh, you know once you know the the, the, the once you have the, the this modern way the only, that's the that's the that's the the way to kind of capture the population most accurately, right? So he was, he, so there was a, a little bit of tension going on. And of course there was a budge, budgetary um, kind of constraint. So, you know, I think there's a re rhetoric, but also there's a reality. Uh, and also of course, how they collected, um, you know, the population facts um, and, and, and didn't necessarily go along with how people started to see the population, right? How different kind of groups started to see the population, the citizen, right? Um, so there was a disconnect, especially in the earlier period. So yeah, I I'd certainly, um, you know, go along with the, with the, you know, with the camp that says, yeah, the transformation wasn't that, um, so, you know, the rupture is not that, you know, it wasn't so clear cut. So that's my first answer. Right. Uh, and then my, my, my section, my second question is about uh, sort of these, uh, I mean, you made very, Ill, you know, various illuminating points about, uh, you know, the coming into being of biopolitical frameworks of governance in Japan. Um, you know, which in many ways um, echo, uh, like like so 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 much of the research on this issue. What's fascinating is that we can see points of intersection with what was going on at different parts of the world, east and west, even north and south. But at the same time, we're also confronted with, you know, different timings, uh, pathways, directions, and. Uh, and so on and so forth. And in the story that you told today, one of the uh, one of the fascinating uh, aspects of the story is how, to me at least, is how, especially using the axes of comparison that you used a little bit today, sort of east-west. Um, you know, it, it it seems to me quite striking how eugenics uh, in Japan, um, you know, came strong at the point in which you know. Um, um, in, on the other side of the world, it, is, it was really going down. 
uh, right? I mean, eugenics uh, fell largely in disfavor in, uh, in Western countries after the Second World War for reasons that are very well known. But in Japan, it seems that, you know, it was one of the, of the, of the, of the major idioms uh, that was used by, you know, um, political elites to kind of find a way of disseminating birth control policies and what was later called neo Malthusian sort of um, ideologies. So sort of my, my question was, um, you know, to, because I, I know that birth control and transnational conversations about birth control were taking place even before uh, the Second World War. Um, you know, via the likes of, you know, you mentioned some of the, of the Americans of the earlier phase, and I think you also worked on that, is um, Margaret Sanger, of course, who also visited Japan. And it's not clear to me, um, you know, uh, how, how, how popular birth control ideologies, um, you know, had become by, you know, World War II in Japan, especially amongst the elites, you know, because, you know, the, the post-war period, as you, as you illuminatingly show, you, you can see how, you know, um, fertility decline in Japan is already, you know, uh, going down post-war, right? And, and so it's targeting really the lower classes with a very strong eugenic component. So, you know, how popular it was the earlier phase of the birth control movement in Japan. I'm just a bit curious about that. You mean, do you mean uh, before the war or the... Before the war. I mean, especially because abortion, as I understand, was, was, was forbidden, right? I mean, it was forbidden yes. before the war. It only became legalized after World War II. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, that's, so, yeah. Yeah. So that's that's one of one of my one of my puzzles. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah. Um, so the um, birth control before uh, the war. Uh, so we're excluding the time of the war because the uh, yeah. well, I mean, as a practice, because it was actually banned, uh, kind of uh, proactively banned. But yeah, birth control. I mean, uh, by way of um, contraception, it was it, it was becoming very popular in um, in in cities. But um, and, and so, like I said in the presentation, it was you know taken up by you know middle class um, you know uh, men and women, uh, in you know intellectual people. Uh, but not necessarily in the, you know, in the rural area. In fact, uh, many of the, uh, ev you know, evidence shows that, um, you know, many of them didn't know, you know, the kind of modern forms of contraception, you know, pessaries and uh, condoms. And, and many men uh, only uh, learned about condoms, you know, like when they were uh, conscripted for the war and, you know, there's a the dark side of the story. Um, but um, yeah, and, but, Abortion was in fact done um, quite, uh, you know, I mean, illegally, uh, but however, but it was practiced evidence, you know, like uh, people like Susan Burns and also Iwata um, in a Jap Japanese scholar um, has actually shown that, um, you know, like they were looking at legal cases, you know, the, the, the ones that were brought up to the court and said that, um, you know, abortion was pretty, common um, among uh, and, and they were common among um, uh, in cities they were common uh, among working uh, population so one working class population and among um, sorry, unmarried um, uh, kind of pop, you know uh, unmarried women so you know clearly it was uh, used as a form of um you know controlling you know basically fertility uh outside of marriage um but yeah so so that so that that was the case so you know it wasn't that you know there were you know it wasn't nothing was going on uh before the war yet um in fact uh, the study in the late 1920s um show that and another of course uh, uh, very common and, and popular form of um, birth control was medicine right uh, pet pill right? Uh, uh, and that was that was really popular and in fact the officials um, the ministry the, um, the um, 
uh, conducted a study, which is kind of marked as, you know, it was a classified document I, I read in the, uh, in, uh, published in 1928, did a study of, um, you know, how popular birth control was. And there's a list of shops, um, you know, pharmacy, you know, kind of pharmacies um, that sold a so-called abortifacient. So, you know, so yeah, it was clearly there. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, we have a question uh, from the audience uh, in the chat box um, from Michaela Kelly, uh, Japanese uh, studies uh, scholar. Um, she asks uh, one point of clarification. The Department of Public Health Democracy, was this at Nihon University or was this a department within the Japanese government? Um, you want to respond to that? She also has two more questions. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think I wasn't that clear, but yeah, it was uh, it was a department within the Institute of Public Health, which was the government. Um, yeah, public health, um, which belonged to the Ministry of Health, health and Welfare. So yeah, it was a government organization. Thanks, Michaela. Okay, and then the first question, or her second question, is: uh, You argued that there was a belief that the Japanese pure blood racial group descended from imperial line not other races. Uh, what does race mean in the context of Japan East Asia at the time? How was race constituted in Japan during the Meiji, Taisho and early Showa periods as you've seen uh, as through your research? It's a big question. This is a big question. <laughs> this is a really, really big question. Maybe I can talk about, um, <laughs> yeah, we can we can talk on and on. Um, but maybe we can talk about, uh, you know, using Koya as an example, right? Um, so Koya, um, like I said, you know, he, he was at the camp of, um, at the at the war, and, and especially he, he wrote this uh, book called, um, Land, Blood and Race in, that was published in 1941 at the height of you know, the war, uh, Japan's participation in the, in the Asia Pacific War. Uh, and in, he was saying that you know, the Japanese race um, you know, is, is, is pure because it just descended from the, um, this one family, which is imperial family. Uh, but in fact, at the time, his I idea um, was it not, I mean, it's just one camp. Um, the other was uh, what, the, what Jennifer Robertson called a uh, mixed blood uh, camp, uh, which uh, argued that uh, Japan is a hybrid, right? And especially like white Caucasian and Ainu. And at the time in the, in the, uh, in the forties, you know, people like Jae Wang Hoon has already shown race, race scientists, um, you know, Japanese race scientists uh, began to kind of uh, argue for a kind of um, um, kind of hybrid rigor um, or, or the, the Japanese um, uh, kind of the, uh, and uh, is a descendant of Koreans and, you know, and this and, and this kind of um, uh, argument, a uh, kind of mixed blood camp argument, of course, upheld Japan's um, um, kind of uh, racial harmony policy, right, at the time. Uh, and so I think even among the racial scientists, you know, I, I think in, in a way, Koya's, um, Koya became really big in, uh, you know, and, and Koya's argument, this pure blood argument uh, became quite, um, how do you call it? Uh, quite uh, mainstream after after the war, when you know Jap Japanese, you know, kind of started to talk about um, kind of you know uh, racial homogeneity and etc. But it wasn't necessarily the kind of theory, um, you know, during the nineteen forties. So yeah, so I think I think I stop I stop there. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, uh Third question from Michaela is, um, she's curious about your use of the expression population science uh, as opposed to demography, or um, could you clarify a little bit more your yeah. population science? Yeah, absolutely. So, so demography is a, you know, it's, it's, is a, is a word today, like I said, in the, in the, um, uh, in the, um, 
in the presentation. And there are two reasons why I don't want to use this term. One is that, um, you know, the use of demography, uh, firstly, the, uh, in, in Japanese it's called jinkogaku, so a study of population. Uh, so this uh, uh, naming itself is not necessarily, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of recent thing. Um, kind of historically speaking. So it was a kind of post-war thing. So I don't want to use that, you know, demography um, to, to, to describe is because, because of the, you know, kind of expansive, um, you know, coverage. I want to, you know, the, the ways I want to, to use, you know, show um, was a long um, kind of durée, right? a, a kind of long process I wanted to show that um, started you know, in the Meiji period and onwards. So I think to use that word demography to describe, um, you know, population statistics or vital making of vital statistics at the time is, you know, I thought maybe it's kind of like verging on presentism, you know, so I didn't want to use that. Um, another reason why I didn't want to use that was because, um, you know, certain if I use demography, which primarily refers to today, refers to either population, you know, it's a, it's a kind of synonym for population, right? Uh, uh, the subject matter or the field of study, uh, you know, study of population. Um, I thought that a certain way of really convoluted history that constituted the making of the ways in which popular, you know, science and statecraft um, kind of, you know, uh, intertwined uh, for the purpose of governing, um, got kind of lost, you know, um, again, you know, using that, you know, I thought it was, um, uh, you know, if I use that terminology, it kind of limits my scope, I thought. So for instance, I show you, uh, um, I'll tell you, so uh, in chapter two, I look at uh, the making of vital statistics along with uh, of course, and the, and the government uh, kind of use of vital statistics, along with the um, the establishment of medical midwifery, um, and I kind of try to thread these um, history together because um, you know I thought uh, you know as far as I can see it, the making of these two elements uh, kind of you couldn't really kind of detach from each other uh, um, if I focus on this interplay, right? Science, statecraft, interplay. But of course, from you know today's understanding, you know, midwifery is not is not demography. I mean, it is a coterminous to demography, but not necessarily. So I thought, you know, if I kind of use that term, um, yeah, that kind of nuance story I wanted to get, I wanted to kind of come across gets kind of lost. That that's why. But thank you. Thank you. I, I also thought if I may just, oh, we have a question from um, uh, a, uh, could you could you please um, uh, open your camera and uh, oh. introduce yourself? Thank yeah. you. Hello. Hello, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Homei, and I'm Ho Xin Chen and from the University of Manchester. And thank you for this inspiring uh, speech. And I learned a lot from your uh, presentation. And I wonder that uh, who were the people to uh, uh, communicate or to teach the popu population, population, especially in the rural area, area about this uh, knowledge or this uh, policy? Because in, in the same time, uh, after the Second World War in Taiwan, the Taiwan government, they learned the model from the US and they said they established a, a, a professional uh, career that uh, called the public health um, nurse. And this, this professional experts, they, they walk into the houses with to the to the married woman and to teach, taught them how to use the condom, how to, uh, to calculate their um, menstruations and to, 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 uh, to accomplish the, the, we call the fa family plans, planning. So I wonder what's, uh, is that the same um, 
model in, in the Japan or there's a different uh, kinds of uh, policy to, to accomplish the, this task. Thank you. Just to clarify, portion, portion, portion um, lives across the street from me in a way, kind of not uh, institutionally. So he's at, he's at the Center for the History of Science, Technology, Medicine, where I did my PhD, uh, and I teach at the moment in uh, uh, in East Asian studies. So, uh, but we 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 decided we're going to have some reading group, right? Reading and writing group. So, uh, but thanks for uh, the question for for your question portion. Um, so in in japan like in taiwan um so mostly female um health practitioners um uh were kind of made in charge of really communicating and, and really kind of um uh yeah promoting and, and also um uh, making contraceptives available at wholesale price initially it was kind of subsidized by the government and it was free but it turned into you know it wasn't uh, it didn't last long, but anyway. So, so in in Taiwan, unlike in Taiwan, in, Jap in Japan, in fact, um, Japan implemented the uh, public health law during the wartime, and the category of public health nurses uh, were there before um, the. So, so they were one of one of the one of them, um, but also midwives as well. Um, and in fact, the government, um, you know, after the policy, um, you know, the birth control policy, the government um, uh, kind of re amended the eugenic protection law. So this, this whole birth control policy was uh, executed or, or implemented through the eugenic protection law, which actually, you know, shows the, again, kind of um, um, an interesting aspect of uh, this family planning initiative. But anyway, so amended the law and created um, a new kind of professional category called uh, field, um, birth control field uh, workers. So, uh, but, but they were mostly yeah, public health nurses and they were midwives and they, you know, they, they retrain in a way uh, those existing female healthcare practitioners, you know, kind of locally embedded um, practitioners uh, to, you know, so, so they could actually introduce uh, uh, um, those. Um, yeah, but um, sometimes uh, local doctors did it. Um, and, but yeah, so, but fe female um, practitioners were mo mostly, they were, they, were the, they were the ones who did the, who did the, the work. And, and use what's really important, I don't know about the Taiwanese case, in the Japanese case, what's really important was that they use, um, and it's similar to the kind of Korean, South Korean case, they use the um, kind of existing local organizations, so, fem you know, like women's organization, yeah, um, to, to, to kind of make it easier to kind of communicate, right, instead of, you know, creating their own, um, yeah, so you use that kind of existing infrastructure to for that for the kind of popularization uh, work. Well, I think I could carry on the conversation for another hour because it's um, it's it's fascination. But I'm afraid that uh, we're going to have to put an end to the conversation. But I think that um, and the last question is also a good reason why perhaps using population science is more uh, inclusive than demography in the sense that actually science is handling population issues transcend demography right and include all kinds of you know human sciences and and you know uh, public health uh, specialties and and so on and so forth uh, which are part of the technical bureaucrats that you show this uh, today and talk to us about today um, but anyway, thank you once again, Aya, for this wonderful uh, presentation. Um, if you want to watch this webinar again, we are going to upload it to our uh, social media and uh, our website uh, platforms. You can check it out at SciTechAsia.org. You'll also find a selection of all our webinars and podcasts in our website. Thank you once again, and until our next SciTech Asia webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Aya. Oh, thank you very much.